Other habits, habit of mastering one's body. You know, you see the child who impulsively reaches out to grab something else from his neighbor. That's not malicious, not willful, not intentional. It was just there, he saw it. It's almost as if he has not gained full mastery of his body. The habit to peacefully accept no. Now that's a very important habit. Ideally, between the ages of two and three, a child would learn to peacefully accept no most of the time. That it, it's all right if it's not what I want. That's actually a learned skill. That's a habit. Like all habits, some children master them more quickly than others. We can think of the habit of throwing a baseball. That's actually a pretty good analogy. Take the typical four-year-old, five-year-old, stand eight feet away from them, put a ball in their hands, and have them throw it to you. There'll be a few naturals. Some take it first time right to you. Not most. Most it'll go somewhere behind to the side. To the... That doesn't mean they have a major deficit. It means they're not a natural. So you got someone who's not a natural, doesn't instinctively have the habit of throwing a baseball. What do you do? You work with them on it. And the great majority of children within a few months will pretty consistently be able to throw a ball to you. It's the rare, rare exception that that's not true. There are a few that suffer from major uh, disabilities, but that's a small, small percentage. Most children can learn to throw a baseball. The question is, will there be a joyful adult throwing the ball with them? Do that 20 minutes a day, three times a day, and the great, 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 great majority of children will be able to throw a ball within a few months. That's a good analogy for all habits, whether it's the habit of attention, the habit of uh, staying your best self even when things get difficult, uh, the habit of peacefully accepting no, the habit of working when hand and head are tired, uh, the habit of careful and accurate thought, the habit of kindness, all of these things can be cultivated. You just have to lay down the rails, do the leg work, stand beside them, joyfully be with them. I should say again, because that whole idea of joy, it's good to be me with you. I can't lay down a good habit if I'm filled with anxiety. And they read us, the children, they read us, they know us like a book. If I'm anxious or upset, what they'll be doing is figuring out how to protect themselves from me, how to make me happy. And that shuts down a healthy process of cultivating new habits. So uh, to choose a habit that's of some import to quality of life and the way we relate to others, let's take the habit of humility. I think of one student who, when they came to the school uh, in sixth grade, and the first thing they did was go around to their classmates and ask uh, each stu other student, uh, what's your IQ? Well, the reason, of course, they asked this question is they want the other students to tell their IQ so that he could then impress them with how high his IQ was. This obviously is not a way to build an enhanced quality relational life. But he was a young boy, I mean, actually sixth grade, not too young, and had not mastered the habit of humility. I should say six years later, by the time he graduated, it was quite different. He, he was the most humble, sensitive to others, caring, servant of others, interested in their well-being, putting others forward rather than himself. So how do you cultivate that? Arrogance, vanity, humility. Some have one habit, some have the other. How do you cultivate the habit of humility? Well, sadly, in some sense, just memorizing a Bible verse on humility or just hearing a lecture really isn't going to do it. What's going to be required is an adult who cares enough to come alongside to support the child in the formation of a more humble, 
stance towards self and others. Charlotte Mason gives some very clear instructions as to how you do this. The first thing one does is to build an alliance around an idea. So I would pull the child aside. Do you know what I mean by humility? How do you think other people respond if I put myself out as somehow being better or stronger or smarter than them? Does that help relationships? I mean, do you like it if somebody comes to you and tries to prove that they're smarter than you or that they're stronger than you? And what the child says is at that point, it's not near so much important, at least the details of it, as that they are beginning to get the idea that somehow there's a different way, that arrogance is not attractive. You sow a seed. Training and habit begins with sowing an idea and creating an alliance. So I'd really like to help you with this. I'd like to help you with your friendships, with your classmates. I'd like to help you with the way you come across to others because you are a sharp, engaging young man that's got so much to contribute. But arrogance hides all that. I'd like to help you. How, how do you think I could help? And again, having him write an essay on the virtue of humility is not going to help. Being punitive is not going to help. What we need to do is, in Charlotte Mason's words, become the friendly ally. I am here with you and for you to help you over, overcome this vice of arrogance and cultivate the virtuous habit of humility because it's in your best interest. And here's the thing, they will always read our hearts. A child always knows if I'm trying to use habit training as a tool of control so that I feel better about everything and I feel successful versus a genuine concern for the well-being and growth of the child. I desperately want you to be all that you were created to be, and I see how this bad habit's going to be a hindrance, and I am with you and I am for you. The number one mistake that I see parents making is disciplining out of their own emotional state rather than being engaged in a work of formation for the betterment of the quality of life of their child. Same thing holds true with teachers. I mean, we see the teacher who becomes upset with her class because the class is not conforming to her expectations and therefore she gets or he gets angry. But it's really not about the well-being of the students and they read that immediately. It's about the teacher's need to regain control of her own emotional internal sense.